everybody welcome. Uh, thanks for being at the Blockchain Tech Summit. Uh, we wanted to have a panel here, a little bit uh, more, talk more about community and uh, sort of how blockchain can help uh, build communities as well as how people can uh, utilize basically a lot of the benefits that blockchain brings. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, we've got Jake Brockman. Uh He's actually from Brooklyn, uh, NYU. Uh, I'll come up, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, sort of, uh, I guess, how, how, you, how did you get started with Coin? Uh, coin yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Jake Brookman, I'm the founder of Coin Fund. Uh, I'm a technologist. I worked for about five years in um, you know, the hedge fund world here in New York, about two years at Amazon, and was a CTO of a fintech startup. I learned about Bitcoin pretty early in 2011. I had a hacker friend who sent me half Bitcoin that year, um, and then started paying a lot of attention in mid-13. I actually bought some Bitcoin at Coinbase, uh, and then finally when Ethereum came along, it just made a lot of sense to me, and I um, kind of asked the question, of why don't people diversify portfolio into digital assets? Sort of a politically incorrect question to ask at the time, uh, given the excitement around uh, Bitcoin itself, but uh, luckily worked out. Um, Coin Fund is one of the first US-based uh, crypto funds uh, in the sense that we regard digital assets as an asset class. We've been investors in the space for about three years. Um, we just launched our, our second fund this year in partnership with Venrock um, and have done a, as a team of a bunch of advisory work for companies like King Interactive, uh, UNow, um, and a lot of much earlier stage uh, startups in the space uh, around building crypto economic systems. Very cool. And to my left, we have Jamie Gunn. Yes. Uh, what would say Latin American uh, blockchain? Yeah, group. we're focused on Latin America. Yeah. Uh, so, tell us a little bit about that. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jaime Wood. I'm originally from Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, I co-founded Latin Blockchain Group with my partner right here, Manhattan Benchimo from Colombia. So what we're doing is we're, we're trying to build communities in Latin America for blockchain. We, have, we partnered with Blockchain at Berkeley, which is an organization made by the students at Berkeley, to teach people and make courses uh, to do all about cryptocurrencies and blockchain. It's free courses that are online. So what we're doing is we're trying to expand them to Latin America. We partnered with them. We're translating all our content into Spanish. Um, we're distributing it all over you know, Central and South America to kind of teach people and get people more involved and uh, build communities. So that's basically what we're doing. We also have another project which we're trying to bring crypto ATMs to Latin America as well. We believe that there's a business opportunity in terms of that and it's beneficial for the people to have it there. Um, we can discuss more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So just a little bit about me, the moderator uh, for this panel. Uh, I'm Greg Nagashak. Uh, I'm CEO and uh, one of the founders of Interpoint, a project that we started last year, uh, essentially to power a lot of these community currencies. Uh, we feel that there still needs to be a technology that's scalable and allows people to uh, transact, maybe a million people buying coffee at the same time to be able to do that. Um, we found that that sort of leads to some of my questions uh, to you guys as well, uh, that Blockchain technology today has been a revolution in store of value and in investments. But as far as payments, uh, I'm curious to know: Have you seen any examples of uh, blockchain and technology or crypto being used by people around you buying coffee or going to the restaurant or anything like that? I guess that would be my first uh, question to you. Guys. I guess we'll start. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, every day I think uh, cryptocurrencies are becoming more and more mainstream and are being used by people as peer-to-peer -peer transactions or even by, by, by stores. Actually, discussing Latin America, there's a whole mall in Panama, which is now accepting four different cryptocurrencies for, you know, the mall has restaurants, it has a, a barber, barber place, it has hair, you know, a bunch of different places, and they all accept crypto. Um, and furthermore, discussing payments, um, a lot of people who work in the US or in Canada have their families back home in South America, a lot of them are going around things like Western Union and making payments in crypto to send money back to South America. It's more efficient and it's you know less time consuming and it can sometimes have less fees than Western Union. So definitely by the day it's becoming more and more mainstream. 
I would, I would actually say that we, we don't see a lot of uh, integration with the currency, especially here in the US. Uh, there's a Bitcoin ATM somewhere on, on 14th Street, but um, I, I think it has to do with, with two issues. One is we're still like extremely early, right? Um, you know, we've seen vendors like Overstock, uh, even Reddit, uh, and others accept Bitcoin as a form of payment, and that's great. Some some vendors got into it and then and it kind of came out. And, and I, I would imagine the reason is because they don't see like today that much ROI from from accepting Bitcoin, just because you know as much as we have grown in, in, in mind share of cryptocurrencies, we're still not at a place where we have enough uh, converted users and technology that they can throw around uh, paying and stuff. I think that's changing uh, rapidly. Um, the other issue is uh, around whether, you know, if you're thinking about actual currency use cases for cryptocurrencies, you have to ask whether um, a cryptocurrency is a, is a good form of currency. And of course, we see a ton of volatility, uh, you know, in pure volatile currencies like Bitcoin uh, today. Uh, and I would argue that that makes them kind of a, not a great currency. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have a, a bunch of projects coming out uh, in the area of stable coins. These are you know, digital currencies that sort of peg their value to a dollar or, or some other um, you know, stable piece of buying power. Um, and I actually think longer term, um, those kinds of currencies will probably serve that, that use case. Yeah, and I think one of the focuses of this panel, I want to really dive deeper into the details of, there's a lot of people talk about these things, and I feel like, okay, Bitcoin's been uh, released in 2008, so we have had about 10 years of Bitcoin, but when people do an ICO, right, or they, they issue a new currency, they usually use, at least I've heard, Bitcoin uh, is, is just a currency by itself, but then Ethereum is something that can power a custom token. The thing is, with Bitcoin, it's like seven transactions per second, and with Ethereum, it's up to 20. And they always say they're going to partition the network and eventually support millions of transactions. But it's, you know, every year, it's sort of a, a little bit of a wait. I guess my question is, what technology do you see being used as like the back end? Like if someone just goes and says, we have a nice currency, right, use it. If they use Ethereum for now, uh, do you think that can scale? Because I think one of the things is that if people are going to use this in the real world, it's going to be simultaneous. And if you have one blockchain powering everything, it's got to be able to handle it like the Visa payment network or like WeChat that was able to do. Do you see any, what projects do you see like that or uh, what technologies do you see going uh, in 2018, 2019? Uh, sure, so one technology, uh, it's actually quite controversial, we were just talking about it before, uh, Ripple. They have a you know cross-border payment system, which you know they they claim to be they claim it to be super fast and allow I don't remember what the number was, but maybe millions of, trans of, of transactions per second between financial institutions and peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, that's definitely a, a project you know to, to look at and research further. Um, but yeah, a lot of people say you know it might be a bit too centralized or doesn't actually fit you know with the general blockchain decentralized system. Which we look at generally, um, but I think that's something to look at. Um, it's, a, it's a big topic and a great question. Um, so I, I think you know <coughs> there's a lot of technologies and sort of approaches that are being uh, worked on today uh, with a focus on blockchain scalability. This is an incredibly important issue, right? We can't uh, really realize sort of the value proposition of blockchain as a global. Uh, financial technology, for example, uh, without having that kind of scalability. Uh, just to give you an example, you know, we work with Kick Interactive. This is a VC-backed company worth you know, about a billion dollars, 300 million registered users. Um, you know, the kind of transaction volume quote, that happens on on their platform, you know, often is multiples of the highest uh, tr uh, transaction volume trading day on. Um, and that's just one company, right? So this is a serious, this is a serious issue. Um, in terms of approaches, I think I think what we're very interestingly seeing is you know, a bunch of layer two technologies around proof of work, uh, or I should say, on top of proof of work consensus systems like Bitcoin, also Ethereum. If you look at the state channels and what uh, I mean, Solomani is doing, uh, you have uh, kind of like alternatives to proof of work, like proof 
proof of stake systems. Uh, Ethereum is on, uh, on that path, sharding systems. Um, you also have completely alternative technologies to blockchain, like if you look at uh, the set of projects working on uh, DAC chains, Whitewall, Hashgraph, um, IOTA to some extent. Um, these are all attempts to uh, kind of lower lower transaction fees to, to make micropayments possible and efficient, and also to build uh, scale. And finally, um, one really interesting thing I, I think we'll see this year is, uh, is that a number of networks are supporting the ethereal, uh, Ethereum virtual machine, right, the EVM. Um, however, the network underneath may work on a completely different uh, consensus technology. And so founders will actually be able to, like I say, vote with their feet um, by moving their smart contracts to the platform that supports their, the level of scale that uh, they need for their application. So I think we'll see a, a bunch of this stuff. Yeah, I think I have a quote to what you were saying, Take Interactive. Uh, I read their white paper where they were doing this seven hundred billion dollar valuation. Sorry, million million dollar right, valuation uh, when they did the, the kin. And one of the things in their roadmap was that they're going to get away from here and have their own sort of centralized thing for a while, right? Uh, and I think that was because of the volume that you're talking about. So, so they're so they so I wrote the white paper. And, uh, they, uh, <laughs> this is why you should come to the summit. <laughs> Um, so they have kind of a two network strategy right now, um, uh, launching an ERC20 uh, asset on, on Ethereum as well as a, a Stellar uh, asset. So Stellar will support a much higher transaction. Right, exactly. So Stellar is uh, sort of an offshoot of, of Ripple's uh, original uh, founder. Uh, one, one of the founders, Mikhail, he went over and started Stellar, and they're innovating in the space of basically uh, there are sort of different technologies where you have, uh, I guess, uh, forms and you have, uh, I guess, form slices, they call it. It's, it's their, their thing. Um, okay, so technology wise, I kind of get that there's a space to innovate to make payments faster. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask about is more of adoption. Okay, so <coughs> to you, in Latin America, for example, we've heard about Venezuela and what's going on there. Um, it's a funny story, actually, but my co-founder, sort of, uh, in, my, in our company, is a little bit responsible for this, uh, that the Venezuelan government decided to make the Petro. Uh, you can ask him if you ever run into him, like, why that is. Uh, and it, but basically, uh, it involves a congressman, long story, but the, the Petro and the S-Coin and all these sort of national currencies that are now being considered, maybe by Israel and others, right? How do you see these coins, first of all, okay, we've talked about the technology, they have to obviously have some sort of very high volume technology, but also how are people going to adopt them? How do you see, like, obviously you've got a government, you're able to make a fiat currency in your country, and I think with Sovereign and others, uh, Malta or something, they've already been able to do that, Japan and stuff, but, but how do you see the actual adoption happening? Like, Man on the street, what do they, they download a wallet, like they go to the store. Because one thing is with WeChat, right? It's not crypto, but it was able to get a million merchants with the help of the Chinese government partially. But that was a huge revolution. It took place while this crypto thing is happening, and it completely replaced cash in many places. Do we see any of that happening with crypto? And how what's the path to adoption if you see in Latin America or anywhere else on the ground? Sure. Um, so, so Venezuela is in the, the Petro. It's, it's a whole topic. Um, most from Caracas have been very affected by the current situation there. Um, but the Petro, you know, coming from such a government, I wouldn't say is very, you know, trustworthy. Um, and it is a new concept to have government-backed cryptocurrencies. You know, as we say, we keep talking how about regulations and about about how most countries are, you know, against having these very decentralized systems of payments. Um, but, you know, recently came out the news also, Nicolas Maduro said that the Petro is legal tender all over and in fact they even offered India uh, a discount for petroleum if they would buy with Petro. Um, but in terms of on the streets, like you were saying, and people having to transact with government backed cryptocurrencies, I think, you know, that's still kind of not very feasible at this point, um, but something which could be later on if, you know, regulators start finding ways to implement blockchain in the way which they see fit. Right. Um, so definitely that, that's, that's what I see now from, from the Petro. 
Um, so it's a really interesting question about how, how mainstream adoption happens, sort of like where, whether it happens uh, in the sense that people are using products up underneath run and blockchain technology in, in, an, in an opaque way, or whether users are directly interacting with um, crypto economic systems or blockchain uh, products. Uh, I, I think the latter is much more interesting if you look at the example of Steemit. Um, here's a social network, kind of like Reddit, but when you get upvotes, you actually earn cryptocurrency. This is an example of a very low barrier to entry uh, for mainstream users kind of product where um, someone can just literally you know, open up their phone and earn money uh, by creating content. So literally uh, translating and converting their content to, um, you know, to tangible value. I think those kinds of products are, are really interesting. I think that um, you know, most mainstream users are, 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 are not that tech savvy, and so they need that kind of product where um, instead of having to go maybe to Coinbase and like you know, learn how to trade or <coughs> my cryptocurrency, they can actually open up their phone and earn it for uh, useful services and content. And I think we'll see a bunch of applications this year that will uh, show you what's done. Yeah, I actually tend to agree. Uh, you know, with the social network being a, a launch pad for a lot of these things, especially with Kick Interactive, for example, or Telegram, biggest ICO so far. And uh, Facebook just the other day announced that they're exploring, they put together a new thing, right, for uh, a blockchain group. Uh, actually, at Interpoint, we had uh, dealt with this a lot. Uh, my first startup was in uh, social networking, uh, building an open source decentralized Facebook, uh, sort of like WordPresses for blogs. You could just own your own data, so the same thing with, uh, with this. And one thing we realized is that payments seem to be different than store of value. So store of value is something that could be slow. You could wait 30 minutes, you could wait Sometimes, you know, I sent money to my friends and it took uh, a few hours back you know, last year. Um, and the thing is, that's fine for online payments too, if you're waiting for the stuff to arrive. Uh, if you want something that's like real life, you don't want your coffee to get cold, you know, waiting for three confirmations. So one thing we noticed though is that for payment processing, it seems that a social networking layer that's already there is a really good, um, sort of substrate, you know? And uh, some more examples, I, I found that um, Facebook Messenger uh, implemented payments years ago, iMessage implemented this year, and Gmail, you can even send money through Gmail, which is a kind of social network. So do you think that maybe existing social networks, WeChat I think is the best example, right? WeChat was a social network and then it implemented payments. But none of those things were crypto until now. Like WeChat's not crypto, Facebook is not crypto, Gmail, iMessage. They're all sort of centralized databases that you trust Apple, you trust Google. Um, do you see this as being like in the next few years? Does payments have a different path than these sort of slower store value? Because you can park your money in a real estate, you can park your money in something, right? But when you have to actually transact, I'm curious about like the existing connections between people. Is that something that you think is necessary to leverage? Or is adoption, can it happen just sort of like as the network grows with payments? Like Venmo, then they add the social later and they try to grow the social from the money rather than the other way around. Um, yeah, so I think when, when discussing social media and payments and transactions peer to peer, um, like I said before, I think it's slowly by slowly going to become more mainstream, more accepted. Also, a lot of these big social media companies, they react to regulators and how lawmakers you know, react to blockchain and how those payments are being processed. But um, I think eventually, yes, I think we're going to see more and more of these social media payment platforms that sh which involve blockchain. I mean, if you want to get really philosophical about it, um, you know, transferring value is a form of communication. and Pretty much all of the companies you named are, are some kind of communication platform, right? like Facebook, Gmail, right? Um, so it's very natural to integrate um, payments into into those kinds of applications. I think it'll take a while, right? And you know, again, scalability is a huge barrier to um, you know to supporting a couple of billion users. And well, Kick has the scale, Facebook, right? Uh, are well, they buying anything? You know? 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure we will see. I'm sure we will see kind of the scalability uh, catch up to um, to those kinds of requirements. Um, and I think longer term, there might even be efficiency and, and sort of lower costs that those companies can gain by outsourcing uh, payment settlement to, to these other networks. But it's also often blockchain is at odds with these companies, like existing business models, especially in Facebook and uh, make, making revenue from ads, whereas blockchain tends to be on the other side of that. So it's going to be a little bit tricky and political for him. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. There's a different philosophy when you're making ads and everything centralized in your central <coughs> servers, which is maybe a good uh, attractive target for the NSA or any sort of advertisers that want to collect information in bulk about people. Whereas, like this is decentralized, more power to the people or power to the whatever project, which brings me actually to another uh, related question about um, raising money. If you have your own project and you're trying to raise money, it used to be there's these gatekeepers, right? And this old uh, money, and there was a good reason for that. It's because in 1933, at least in the U.S., the government said you must be an accredited investor, otherwise there has to be all these disclosures. Um, and now I think we're seeing with the rise of crowdfunding and the Jobs Act, you know, we have a lot of people using the Jobs Act. You know, 506C is something that actually came out in the Jobs Act. Uh, before it was just 506, and you couldn't do a uh, general solicitation. Now we have like all these projects saying, "Hey, we're raising money." Uh, just regulatory wise, and I, I want to hear about Latin America as well. Uh, there's also some regulations, right? That okay, if you're a stable coin, I don't think you're a security. It's my personal. Because you're stable one, you're not going up in price. So that's one of the, the things in this country that is uh, you know, how we test. But if you are not a stable point, you're looking to raise money from investors, and most likely it's because they're going to get something for it. So how do you see um, on a community level? Uh, a community issues its own tokens, a casino issues its own chips, a uh, church issues its own, you know. Uh, currency maybe transact between its members. Are there regulations involved? Does the government come in and say, well, now you've got to register with the SEC? Or do you see a future where uh, you think maybe the US government, like Swiss regulators and others, takes a more flexible approach eventually to this uh, thing and works with, makes it easier to sort of start these things? Because there is risk, obviously. There's risk buying these things, but they're, they're also much more useful than just holding a, a stock. So, what do you think? Five more minutes. Uh, sure, so, I mean, in terms of Latin America, we have a bunch of different countries. All of them have different, you know, the government's have different viewpoints on crypto and crowdfunding. Obviously, crowdfund, crowdfunding is becoming more and more popular. People are raising money online and through technology. Um, but, you know, Chile, for example, the government prohibited banks from dealing with any sort of cryptocurrencies or things like that, so there's a hold there. Um, Argentina is starting to become more and more open to these things. You know, they had National Bitcoin Day recently, um, so opening up to more people. Actually, NEM is creating a community in Colombia. I have a representative from NEM here, from Melbourne. I don't know if he's still here, but um, yeah, so definitely a lot of communities being built. And I think the more we build communities among in Latin America, and the more these regulators and governments start to react to it, the easier it'll be to crowdfund or to maybe conduct an ICO. Or things like that. Nowadays, people are you know looking to go to places where it's more or easier or where legalities are more permitting. Um, but definitely something that that's going to be looked upon, and I think long term it could be much easier to do. Um, so speaking for the U.S. and, I, and I'm not a lawyer, of course, but observationally, um, <clears throat> you know, it all kind of hinges on sort of how uh, cryptocurrencies and digital assets and ICOs are regulated in the United States. Um, the, so far, uh, the SEC has very definitively said that you know, offerings uh, where you're taking money and you're promising kind of future coins, that's definitely a securities offering that needs to go into a Reg D or a Jobs Act uh, uh, regulatory uh, exemption. Um, and then uh, they have also said that you know, very definitively, like Bitcoin is a commodity. So there's a line drawn uh, in terms of classifying the asset class, where is it going to land? I think the, um, you know, kind of the biggest issue, the most pressing issue right now for, for issuers, for startups working on these kinds of projects is, you know, even if they uh, kind of raise money through a very compliant form B, um, however, their token is meant to go to retail users. There's no clear framework for that. Um, we're hoping that there will be some 
guidance from, from our regulators uh, maybe in the next six to 12 months and maybe some legislation uh, in 2019. All right, this is probably going to be the last question. If the, since this is the last panel, if you guys have questions, uh, you can just come up and ask them uh, afterwards. Uh, so I guess my question is about stable coins. I can ask about stable coins that, uh, look, these things have to trade. People have to be able to pay each other. And if they're securities, registering each and every transaction is not going to be uh, practical. I think that if something is a stable coin, then it's similar to the Berkshires, uh, having Ber Berkshires, or Ithaca, ours, or one of these sort of town currencies that crystal pounds, they already exist and they're pegged to the dollar. But these cryptocurrencies are sort of not the same thing as moving money with PayPal. They have their own internal currency. And you cash into the currency and you cash out of it. And internally, it could undergo inflation or whatever. So I think there's a start, uh, startup called Basis that just raised like $133 million to make a stable coin and has been raising Horowitz in the round and others. Really, people are excited about stable coins. Uh, just for everybody in the audience, stable coin basically means that when you get the coin, uh, it roughly is pegged to the fiat, whatever fiat you have, dollar, euro. So the vendor can pay their supply chain and they can actually accept it. Um, how do you, what technologies do you see, what economic techniques do you see? I think there's tethers, there's ways to inflate the supply and everything. Have you seen anything else? What methods do people use to peg something to something in the crypto world? Um, sure, so when discussing Latin America, a stable coin might be something which might be a big hit in terms of that. I've heard people say before, um, discussing people who are working, like I said, in North America and might have their families back home, sending money, you know, going around Western Union, paying those fees and paying for a stable coin, which, you know, is immune to, to insane volatility like we've seen cryptocurrencies in general, um, that could be very, you know, useful for Latin Americans to use. Um, and when discussing also investing in regular cryptocurrencies, a lot of people in Latin America are investing um, to protect themselves from inflation in places like Venezuela where the Bolivar is just tanking and tanking and tanking. Um, but, you know, I think stable coins could be very useful in the Latin American region for that. Um, stable coins, you know, you can roughly categorize them into two kinds, uh, sort of asset backed, something like Tether, where you know, the unit is exchangeable for, for actual um, dollars on the back end, um, or a theoretic stable coins like so, I mean, they both have their plus and minuses, right? Like asset backed coins take on the custodial risk. Um, the game theoretic uh, stable coins always have sort of an error condition where, where they come apart, and it's just a matter of like, can you get this coin to scale uh, large enough that it's uh, extremely stable and there's the probability of failure? Have you heard of any that are stable, like long term? I mean, Maker's been, uh, Maker Die has been fairly stable, uh, and it's, it just came out in the last year. All right, thank you both gentlemen, and uh, let's mingle. Thank you. Thanks so much.